Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar entitled, When You Can't Ask the Resident, Practice Guidelines for Asking Proxies About Resident Preferences. My name is Kendall Lesser and I am the Project Manager for Ohio's Pelican Program aimed at promoting preference-based, person-centered care in Ohio's nursing homes. Before we get started with the presentation, I have a few housekeeping items to go over with you. I ask that for those of you seeking Ohio Social Work CEUs, which I believe can be transferred to nursing CEUs, to please take a moment and click on the link under the chat box and complete the form. In order to issue CEU credits, we must have a record of you signing into and out of the webinar. At the very end of the webinar, you will be asked to complete a webinar evaluation and enter the time that you exited the webinar. Please expect to receive a PDF of your seed EU certificate via email within the next two weeks, but most likely um, more quickly than that. It is very important that we have documentation of every single person who is requesting CEU. So if multiple people are viewing this webinar on one computer, each individual person needs to take a moment and sign in and sign out of the webinar, as well as complete an, an evaluation form at the very end. Again, um, the link to sign into the webinar is under the chat box, and you can just click on that link right now. During today's webinar, we will be discussing special considerations for proxy interviewing tips um, for incorporating friend and family insights into assessments and care planning and identifying ways to build staff observation skills when a proxy is not available. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the Q&A chat box and we will answer your questions at the very end of the presentation. And you'll see on the screen right now um, where the arrow is, that's where you can type your questions and the panelists will be able to respond to those at the very end. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Kimberly Van Heitzma is an Associate Professor of Nursing at Penn State University, as well as the Director of the Program for Person-Centered Living Systems of Care and a Senior Research Scientist at the Polisher Research Institution um, at Abramson Center for Jewish Life. Dr. Van Heitzma's research focuses on seeking to understand the impact of contextual issues such as the physical environment, culture of care, staff interactions, interdisciplinary team processes, and psychotherapeutic approaches to quality of life and quality of care delivery for frail seniors receiving services in the long-term care setting. Our next presenter is Dr. Katie Abbott. Dr. Abbott is the Robert H. and Nancy J. Blaney Assistant Professor of Gerontology and the Scripps Gerontology Center Research Fellow at Miami University. Dr. Abbott's research and teaching focuses on preference-based, person-centered care with a special emphasis on persons with dementia. Doctors Van Heitzma and Abbott have co-authored over a dozen peer-reviewed articles related to the PELI. I will now turn it over to Dr. Van Heitzma. Uh, hello, everyone, and we welcome you uh, to, to this webinar. Um, we do want to just let you know that um, uh, the advice that we're providing today really it comes out of our history in working for over 15 years with long-term care organizations, um, older adults, family members, uh, who were seeking to uh, implement the PELI uh, in their or within their organizations. And so the advice that we're going to provide here today uh, is really to help the, in uh, thinking around developing an action plan as to how to use these preferences um, in, in your daily care activities, the development of procedures and policies, and uh, formalize uh, a standard for how these preferences can be ass assessed. And as was already mentioned today, the goal is really focusing on uh, when the resident cannot be interviewed and when we have to go to other sources for getting that information. Um, and then finally, our goal uh, as a whole for this project is to really look at how you can utilize that information to uh, leverage better uh, care in, in the daily care that you provide. So let's talk just a little bit about uh, person-centered care benefits. Um, and some of this is kind of preaching to the choir because uh, if you guys are on this call, you already understand that the, the person-centered 
uh, care benefits residents, staff, uh, and uh, family members. But just to give a brief overview, um, the literature is pretty clear in the uh, findings that provision of person-centered care fosters engagement on the part of the resident and improves their quality of life and well-being. Um, primarily because preferences are the avenue toward understanding what is meaningful and purposeful to us all. We prefer those things that are um, that have specific meaning to us, and, and that is certainly true for a nursing home resident. Um, it also helps to uh, facilitate the resident's feeling of autonomy and their ability to have their voice um, inserted into directing the care and the services that are being provided and certainly goes a long way to creating a care environment of trust and respect and building those closer relationships uh, with the staff that are providing the care. Next slide, please. From the staff perspective, um, again, the literature is pretty clear that person-centered care has a host of benefits. Uh, staff members are definitely report being more comfortable caring for people that they know um, that they have a better, stronger partnerships with the residents and their families when preferences are discussed. And of course, the staff who knows the person's preferences can adapt more quickly to that person's ever-changing needs and uh, requirements for, for their care and how they like to live their daily life. And then finally, staff um, who do uh, provide person-centered care are highly valued. Uh, within their organizations and the information that they have in terms of knowing more about the residents' preferences and needs helps them to work more efficiently and devote their time where it's needed most. For the organization itself, uh, nursing homes are, who deliver person-centered person care are shown to have better quality outcomes. Um, and again, this is largely due to the ability of staff to more quickly identify and respond uh, to the changes in the rest condition. Um, also, nursing homes can gain referrals from people who have had a good experience and recommend uh, the nursing home to others as a place to receive good person-centered care. And then there's also some evidence to suggest that nursing homes uh, have better staff retention. Uh, again, due to that building of the relationship between staff and residents. So typically when you would uh, seek to assess preferences, of course, we would ask the resident first. And the, that interview process and in, in talking with a resident is to find out which preferences are the most important to him or her, how satisfied they may be with whether those preferences are being fulfilled, uh, at, the, at that moment in time. But of course, what happens is the resident is unable to communicate and cannot be interviewed. So just like we would do with uh, anything related to the MDS or any other assessment tool, uh, we would seek out a family member or friend who knows that resident well to begin the assessment process. So what does the literature tell us in terms of what we know about uh, family members or friends as uh, proxies um, in speaking for the residents and their, their loved ones? Well, we know that, of course, families continue to provide support to older adults even after they enter the nursing home. So they're very much uh, there and uh, want to be a part of the partnership of, of providing care. And then, in fact, Families uh, serve a very important role in helping to support individualized care uh, in the nursing home environment. On the flip side, though, we also know that family members are not always um, fully understanding what an older adult's preferences may be. And this can be a variety of reasons why that is true. Um, some uh, folks may not have uh, actually provided care uh, to the older adult or they may uh, live at a distance and not fully understand what, where the person is uh, coming from uh, in their daily activities and daily needs at the moment. Um, but uh, having said that, the uh, literature is pretty clear that proxy reporters are uh, right uh, more often than wrong in terms of their um, reporting of, of the preferences of their loved ones. And so on balance, uh, we know that it is a good idea to go and ask uh, family members 
uh, about the preferences of their loved one. So just to say a little bit about the, some of the work that we've done, we recently completed a study where we were looking at uh, 20 different nursing homes and resident and family member uh, dyads um, that uh, uh, participated in this study. Next. And the nursing home residents uh, were uh, cleared by the, a physician for capacity to consent and that they were medically stable. So again, to be clear, we were talking with nursing home residents who could report on their own preferences. And this was using the tool for the uh, for the Pelly itself, which is, as you all know, now a 72 item um, uh, uh, tool that helps us to assess the importance of everyday preferences in care. And the findings from that study were that uh, you can see here, read through what some of the agreement agreement was between those residents. Uh, who could speak for themselves and their uh, family member or friend. Uh, and these were some of the areas where they were very good agreement in terms of what the resident said they preferred and what the family member or friend reported um, that the resident preferred. So some nice um, uh, checks in terms of the, that if we ask a family member about eating, what ha well, how the resident uh, feels better when they're upset, what clothes uh, they want to wear, privacy, things like that. These are all things that we can uh, reliably um, uh, take uh, from a proxy and say that uh, we, we can care plan around these types of, of preferences. Um, on the other hand, we look at some of the deviations about where preferences uh, be reported by both a proxy and a, and a nursing home resident may be different. And so here, proxies underestimated the importance of uh, the resident's uh, level of importance in listening to music, being involved in cooking, exercise, volunteering your time, being around children, the, choosing your own medical care professional and how to care for your mouth. So these are things that were the proxy thought that this were things were not as important to the resident and the resident said, no, these are things that are on average, you know, very important to me. And on the other hand, uh, there are three preferences where proxies overestimated the importance of the preference compared to the resident. So the, pre the proxies thought that having snacks available between meals was more important than the resident did napping was more important, and choosing what time to get up. So again, these are just some guidelines for you to think about as you kind of use your clinical judgment and in um, taking the responses from proxies and kind of moving forward from a care planning perspective. So in conclusion, families are, are getting it right on the majority of preferences. Um, and so really are an important source about the residents' preferences when they uh, can no longer be interviewed. Great, thank you, Kimberly. Um, so this is Katie, and I'm gonna take over from here and walk you through our chip sheet on working with proxies. And you'll find this um, is a download as part of the webinar. If you have trouble um, contacting it, we have our emails at the, at the end of the webinar, and you can email us directly, and we can send you these PDFs. So the first piece that we wanted to go over with you in terms of working with proxies is this idea of um, approaching the resident three separate times on different days before determining that the interview cannot be completed. Um, we, we realize that residents have good days and bad days, and we want to try and approach them different days and times of day to make sure that we really are not able to um, get information from them. And then decide if you're going to perform in-person interviews with your proxies, if you're going to do phone interviews with your proxies, if you want to do an email survey monkey, or if you want to send it in mail by the, you know, by snail mail or a combination. So these are some things that you, your organization will need to think about. And think about 
which staff member among your organization will perform the proxy interviews and coordinate with the family or friend proxy. Um, there's been a lot of talk about which family member or friend should be asked to participate in the proxy interview. And this is a process by which you might ask, you know, who among these variety of family members might be the best one um, to, to do the interview. Um, and then finally, create an information flyer to include in new admissions folders explaining the reasons why preference assessments um, are being performed with your organization. So additional tips in engaging with family and friends is to help the family and friend understand why it is important for providers to know about resident preferences. It's a little bit of education right here where you have to explain to, to your, your family members and to their friends that knowing about this resident will help you provide more tailored care. And it's information to help improve both the medical and non-medical aspects of care because there's more than just medical parts of care. Um, and it's important to recognize and reiterate that the family or friend voice does not become a replacement of the resident's voice, but that it's a complement in the care planning process. We recommend engaging family and friends by using them as an additional resource um, to, for finding further details about resident preferences. They can help discover interests interest that can be used to create unique and individually tailored inter interventions. And finally, the family and friends may be interested in serving as a care partner and facilitating activities related to a resident's important preferences. We've heard from some organizations that residents will refuse to go to activities and they've recommended that family members try to come and go with them to activities as that may be, um, it may help facilitate the activity and, and the fam and the resident feeling more comfortable doing those activities. And it's also too important to support family and friends in recognizing that despite physical and functional declines, preferences do remain important to the older person. And even if the person is not able to do them well or as well or is not as you know, or is not as involved in the care, it's at these times that we see um, that family support with the preferences is even more critical. Um, when there's greater decline, that even a small pleasure um, can be can be experienced. Um, and with the with the support from the staff and the activities staff in helping to modify these important preferences to a person's current abilities is crucial. So if you choose to do in-person interviews, we recommend that you find an interview location that is close and private. We recommend um, that you Try to work with a proxy to find a time that's convenient for both of you. And be sure that the proxy can hear you to the best of their ability. Um, if the proxy wears glasses or hearing aids, try to remind them and ensure that they're in place prior to the start of the interview. These are similar to, to some of the tips we gave uh, during our last webinar. And again, review all the interview instructions prior to speaking with the proxy. Um, you want to be fully prepared to decrease confusion with your family member or the friend. And stress how you're seeking what the proxy thinks the resident would prefer, not what the proxy prefers. And this is tricky. Um, it's very difficult for um, some people to put themselves in their, in their loved one's shoes. They might want their loved one to participate in all these activities um, and and it's something that you just have to constantly stress. Well, what do you think your mom or dad would prefer? If you're going to do phone interviews, we recommend that you schedule, again, a time of convenience for this family or friend. Double check when you make the call. Is this still a good time to chat for about 20 minutes? 
and explain the reasons why you're seeking information about the person's preferences. So a sample script that we've provided here for you. Dear Mrs. Smith, my name is Joe, and I'm calling from the Red Hills Nursing Center. Everything is fine with your mother. We are starting a new initiative to learn more about resident preferences, and I was wondering if you had a few minutes to talk with me about your mother's likes and dislikes. I have a few questions that we would like you to answer. Would you, uh, we would like for you to take the perspective of your mother and answer how you think she would if she was able. This information will help us provide better care to your mother. So again, feel free to take that script and adapt it for your use. We have not had a lot of success with mailing um, the Pelly to family members and proxies and getting and having it returned to us. And so we recommend this option with caution. Um, I think that you will probably have better success if you try to do an in-person or telephone um, interview with individuals. If you do choose to do a postal mail interview, try to use a larger font size, maybe a 14 or 16 font size when creating the questionnaires, just so it's easier to read. And you'll want to include a brief cover letter explaining the importance of the family and friend and completing and returning it. And you might want to include the date by which you'd like it returned. Sometimes we all work better with deadlines, right? Um, include a self-addressed stamped envelope for the family or friend to return with postage paid so they don't have to go to the post office and, and cover the postage. And we recommend calling with a reminder um, about two weeks after mailing, if you've not received it yet, to say, please, you know, you should have received this. Please um, complete it and return it. And then that might be a time also that if they've not received it, to send another copy in the mail. Um, um, and we recommend maybe after a month sending another copy with a new cover letter if need be. And at this point, I want to turn it back over to Kimberly to talk about how um, you can also um, engage staff members as proxies if you're unable to find a family member or friend. Go ahead, Kimberly. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, so as Katie mentioned, uh, you know, there are uh, many instances where a person either does not have a family member or friend to contact or um, they're just simply not responsive, uh, live too far away, um, or uh, the, the family member or friend is um, not responsive uh, to the request for information and, and or says, well, I, I really can't answer these questions. Um, so in those instances uh, where the resident is both, of course, unable to speak for themselves uh, and we're unable to get a family member or friend, we uh, have to rely on, on our staff uh, observations and experiences uh, with uh, their direct care uh, work with the resident. So um, one, one uh, avenue for doing this is to uh, observe the emotional response of, of the resident uh, in an activity that um, you have some uh, reason to think that this is a preferred activity for the resident. And oftentimes staff have a pretty good sense most of the time of uh, what a resident does or, or does not prefer in a global sense. Um, and this is uh, by observing the person's emotional response to an activity you can get a better a handle on whether that person is indeed um, enjoying that activity and signs of enjoyment and interest are uh, signs that an activity is indeed a preferred activity. So here are two examples of, of interest and pleasure and the um, words that are listed on the screen there are um, uh, the descriptions of what emotion looks like uh, in, in terms of its nonverbal um, expression. So things like participating in a task or having good eye contact or eyes that follow uh, an object or a person looking around the room or being responsive by turning your body toward something, those are all indications of a person who is interested. 
uh, in, in what is going on around them. And therefore, again, you're, you're hitting the right note in terms of uh, finding a, a preferred activity for that person. The same is true for pleasure. So if a person laughs or sings, smiles, maybe uh, makes kissing motions or strokes, gently touching, reaching out warmly, um, or responding again uh, to, um, to an activity such as music, and this may again be signs that the person is experiencing pleasure. Now, the beauty of nonverbal uh, observation of emotion is that um, ob observed emotion has been demonstrated through the work of Paul Ekman and others um, to be culture free and true across age groups and different types of um, ethnicities. Um, it is truly universal to how our brains are wired as human beings to express an emotion non-verbally using these types of non-verbal indicators. Um, we had done some work um, a few years ago to test this out in the context of dementia, and we found that even at, you know, well into the course of dementia, people retain the ability to express emotion through these non-verbal means. So, it's something that you can take to the bank in terms of uh, a way of training your staff to look for signs of interest and pleasure, and that if you're seeing these, then if through uh, you can communicate that to the care planning team um, that these activities are indeed preferred activities for that resident. On the other hand, if you uh, see signs of negative emotions, such as sadness, anger and anxiety, then you're in the territory that uh, this is not likely to be a preferred activity for that resident. Um, sadness, the signs of sadness are such things as obviously crying, but frowning, um, moaning, sighing, putting uh, your head in your hand. Um, those are all things that would be an indication uh, that the person may be experiencing um, sadness at that time and during that activity. Anxiety, on the other hand, um, can be uh, evidenced by uh, calling out, such as shrieking or being repetitive in what you're, uh, what you're saying, um, expressions of uh, restlessness or agitation, having deep lines across the forehead with the, uh, with the uh, eyes, or the eyebrows drawn together, um, hand wringing, um, uh, tremoring, jiggling, uh, rapid breathing, eyes opened up wide, and in general having tight facial muscles. These are all things that, again, we as human beings express non-verbally when, uh, when we are anxious. And then finally, anger is probably one that's the most easy to rate. It's hard to miss uh, when someone is ang angry with you, uh, especially if there's physical aggression going on or cursing, berating, shaking of fists. Um, but there are certainly more subtle signs, such as drawing your eyebrows together, clenching your teeth, pursing your lips, narrowing your eyes, um, or waving someone away or, or uh, with a distancing uh, gesture. So the uh, observation of both positive and negative affect, uh, can, uh, the tool I'll show you next here, um, is uh, putting together all of those nonverbal signs in one place um, about how uh, human beings express um, a different emotional states. And there are some training materials available for uh, training your staff. We have a, a couple of videos uh, that um, are available that uh, can help you train your staff to be more sensitive to these, uh, these signs of um, positive and negative emotion, and then again, using those as ways of indicating whether an activity is preferred, and if it is preferred, then by all means keep doing it, um, and the negative emotion is a sign that uh, the activity that is going on uh, is not preferred and therefore can be a uh, something that can be discussed at care planning to figure out how you can turn that negative affect into a positive affect uh, for that individual. Great, thank you, Kimberly. And so um, what we'd like to turn to next is to tell you a little bit about thoughts on care planning. 
Um, and please remember to put any questions into the Q&A box um, that you can see in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Um, we would encourage you to encourage the proxy to attend care planning sessions, either by phone or in person, and, and track reasons why they aren't able to attend and potentially engage in a plan, do, study, act cycle, quality improvement cycle, to try to figure out reasons for this non-attendance and make it easier for these individuals to attend. Their insight could be very valuable to um, moving your efforts forward in terms of, of person-centered care. It would be um, a good idea to have a staff member set up a meeting with the proxy and the resident prior to care planning to discuss the results of, of different tools that you may use. In case you're using the PELI, there's also the Advancing Excellence Person-Centered Care Tool, and develop suggestions for improvement. Or you might have some ideas. You might say, um, we found this preference is, is important to you. What are some ways that we might be able to fulfill that preference? Um, and so it's and how might it need to be modified and still be fulfilled? And so again, these proxies can be engaged on multiple levels um, as, you know, as, as information um, givers and um, bring assistance to your care planning. So our take home message really um, with all of the work that we've been doing is that individuals with mild to moderate dementia can still report on their values and preferences. They can do so reliably and consistently. We don't recommend hard cutoffs, such as a certain MMSE score or a certain BIM score, because those cutoffs may not always be the best indicator of a person's capability of responding about their preferences. And so it's really where, um, as Kimberly mentioned, that to come back to your clinical judgment. Um, and research supports the positive impact of having family and friends involved in care and the fact that they can provide social supports for a resident even after transition to a nursing home and can serve as advocates for individualized care planning. Oftentimes family and friends aren't really sure how to, what their role is now that their loved one is in a nursing home. And you can provide some of that guidance through these structured ways um, and really try to welcome them in and say, here are some ways that we can use your help if, if, if they are willing and if they have support. Obviously, we recognize that not all residents will, will have this kind of family support. And so we'd encourage you also um, to, to in, the, in the question and answer, indicate any facilitators or barriers you've experienced with engaging proxies. Um, I think that that's an interesting piece. The more we hear from you, the more we can help remediate some of these barriers and then share some of the successes as well. Um, we also want to remind you to submit your questions to us anytime. Even if it's after this webinar, send us emails um, or call us. Um, Kendall Lesser is our project manager and she will take your calls. You can remain anonymous if you wish, or you can send us an email. Um, as we've mentioned during the last webinar, we really want to create an opportunity for a partnership so that providers can interact and learn from each other by sharing successes and stumbles, and we want to facilitate that, that ability. Um, as we mentioned last time, we're embarking on a listening tour and would be honored to visit your facility and learn more about maybe how you integrate proxy information into your care plans um, or engage with proxies or anything related to the preferences for everyday living. Um, we'd love to hear about, as I mentioned, the barriers and the facilitators. And there's Kendall's information again. To find more resources, um, you can go to the website preferencebasedliving.com. It's under construction, but there are some resources there right now. We hope to develop it more fully over the coming months. And also, please sign up for our newsletter. And I'll paste the newsletter link into the chat box so that you can um, 
You can sign up for that and just put that in there. Oh, I sent it. Uh, let me send it to all participants here. And then um, also what we want to um, let you know is that our next webinar will be in January. So we recognize that November and December are very, very busy months. Um, lots of holidays, lots of activities going on. And so in January, we will come back to you with our next webinar on promoting resident choice. And so this webinar will help identify ways to support and encourage nursing home residents to state their preferences and direct their care as much as possible. Um, it, the, the information that we'll provide reflects best practices among nursing home staff and administrators to overcome both the logistical and the cultural challenges to respect individual preferences for daily schedules, activities, and interactions. And that'll be Tuesday, January 24th from 2 to 3. And again, there's the link for um, participating in the webinar, and I'll post it into the chat box. And finally, we'll stop here. Our emails are listed. We want to thank you for attending, and we'll go into our question and answer period now. Um, I see we've got several questions um, added to the piece. And remember to stay. If you're, if you're seeking the um, CEU credits, please stay on until the end so that you can sign out of the webinar and we can um, process your CEU credits. So, Kendall, how about questions? All right. Yeah, we've had a few come in. And um, one of the first questions is, how important is it for short-term residents to have a detailed PELI and a detailed care plan? Well, that's a great question. Um, so in our last webinar, we, we spoke a little bit about this, where we recommend um, engaging with your long-term residents around the PELI. We recognize that you may only have short-term residents for a matter of days, maybe up to 20 days at most, and they may not see this as relevant to them, and it may be very difficult for you to be able to even put this kind of information into a detailed care plan. Um, and so we recommend starting with your long-term residents on the PELI initiative. Um, and I know that on the last webinar, we had Cheryl from the Ohio Department of Medicaid. She um, stated that one of her most important pieces is that pain management um, is, which is a clinical indicator, not part of the PELI, um, is really the, should be the emphasis for those short-term residents so that they're able to go to rehab and able to get stronger and better to go home. And one other thing that we've mentioned, and then I'll turn it over to Kimberly for any additional pieces of advice, is that if your organization has a home health organization, doing the PELI um, with your short-term residents might be a great handoff to your home care organization to help them guide care, goals, values, and activities. Kimberly, anything you'd like to share or add? Yeah, I think that last point is really, uh, really important to emphasize in that, um, you know, preferences are uh, something that are inherent to um, who people are and um, as such is something that's really important to think about as people transition across different settings of care. So this idea that you would, of course, everybody collects the uh, MBS Section F in short term uh, rehab, and so those items, of course, uh, would be um, important to figure into uh, their plans of care if the person has important preferences, um, uh, and uh, they will, of course, leave the short-term rehab with those uh, short-term preferences intact. Um, so starting with the MDS Section F, um, thinking about how uh, those preferences might um, be impacted by the uh, person's particular reason for why they're in short-term rehab, how that uh, may affect their behavior and their goals following a discharge from um, the short-term rehab. Those are all really important pieces of information that preferences can provide. So unlike in the long-term care arena where you're really thinking about preferences from the perspective of providing meaningful, purposeful, a tailored uh, daily plans of care for the person who is living in their home, 
in short-term rehab, people are not living in their home, you're really thinking about preparing them for returning to either their home and their, or their next setting of care. So preferences serve a little bit different purpose uh, within short-term rehab. And I think the short answer is starting with those um, MVS Section F preferences and making sure that the team uh, thinks about them relative to uh, that person's next setting of care uh, would be an important way to utilize the preference information. Great. All right. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, I have another question that came in, and is that, and this question is, do we need to use the same response options with proxies as we do with residents? So we have a great question. Kimberly, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, so um, it, the simplest answer is to use the same, uh, the same uh, Likert scale as we do with residents, but this has come up um, in a couple of different contexts, and sometimes um, even though the uh, MDS Section F preferences are laid out uh, in the exact same response set as the, the PELI, we actually modeled the PELI after that MDS Section F uh, to make it consistent because we knew that uh, facilities were already asking um, uh, using that response set. But in fact, what we found is that it is pretty hard sometimes for people to use that response scale. And that sometimes you can get um, the, the information that you're looking for, which is a preference important to that person, yes or no, or mostly yes or mostly no, um, is uh, really the, the um, goal that we're striving toward. So unlike the MDS where we must use that response scale, um, within the PELI, um, it, there are some options in terms of using um, the uh, uh, important, very important, somewhat important as a yes response and uh, not, in, not very important or not important at all as sort of a mostly no uh, response and kind of moving forward from there. So I think that if you encounter the, um, uh, that same type of difficulty with family members um, using that kind of strategy for getting at the mostly yes or mostly no um, and circling um, the uh, response uh, accordingly uh, is referred to as an unfolding process. So um, that, uh, that is definitely a, uh, another strategy that people have used to, to get the information that they need. Great. And another question just popped up. Um, what time frame should the PELI be completed um, in upon admission, and how often should they be updated? And so I believe um, that most organizations have, is it 21 days to complete their care planning? And so what you're looking at here is if you want the PELI to inform your initial care plan, it would be important to at least get some items from the PELI answered. And in our previous webinar, we talked about um, starting with 10 to 15. You can start with the MDS items. You can look at the 72 items and pick the 10 to 15 that speak to your, the mission of your organization. And those could start the initial um, composition of your care plan. And then in terms of how often they should be updated is we recommend that a couple of things. One, we see um, relative stability in people's preferences over a three-month time period, which is, of course, um, as is mentioned, correlated with the MDS timeline. So MDS timelines are done on admission and quarterly. And then during significant change, and so again, we see in our research that if there is significant change in someone's mood, um, like depression, anxiety, that's a time to reassess preferences as well. Kimberly, would you like to add anything more about that? Uh, I guess I'll just uh, amplify the next question, which is the correlation with the MDS timeline. Um, and uh, as you already mentioned, you know, the, um, the stability of preferences 
uh, we've checked for that three month period because that is the period between care plans, between the mandatory care planning period. So, in fact, uh, one strategy that you might want to use is to uh, mirror uh, the care planning cycle for when you ask these preferences so that you have those preferences available to you um, ahead of that care planning meeting. Um, so uh, how often you decide to do that, and we have had organizations all across the board. Some people um, try to do a, uh, a set of preference questions um, prior to uh, every care planning meeting, every three months. Others say this is something that we're going to uh, check on uh, for that person's annual uh, care plan meeting. So, uh, but tying it to their MDS cycle of assessment is a very good strategy uh, because now you have a very holistic look at that uh, individual in terms of everything else, physically, emotionally, um, socially that's going on, you know, with that individual as well as an up-to-date preference assessment. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, we have another question, and that is, what happens if a family member reports his or her own preferences instead of the resident's preferences or tries to influence the resident's answer during the PELI interviews? This is a, another tricky question, um, and there's several ways that you can move forward. Um, one, of course, is to, again, try to reiterate that you're seeking the residents' preferences, that it's, it's great to know what the family member prefers, and that you'll take that, and you'll write that down, and you'll take that into consideration. But could they think and sort of put themselves in, the, in, in their loved one's shoes and think about how they might respond, um, especially since they're unable to communicate um, right now. And so, again, try to reiterate the, the need to, to sort of have the family member think about the resident first. And then they can always tell you their preferences later. Um, and we recognize that this is a carefully, this is a ballet that you are putting together here where you're trying to meet families' expectations but also some education can come into play here. Um, and this is where we recommend maybe some flyers and we're, we're working on developing some of those that you can use in terms of how to educate the family member about why these are important and why we're asking them to report as if their loved one was reporting. Kimberly, what would you add? Yeah, I think you, you did a very nice job summarizing that, Katie. I mean, and, and again, um, the, the idea that you're gathering information always uh, from the resident as well through your observations uh, of their responses to, um, uh, to a particular activity is another thing that you can certainly report back to family members and saying, you know, that in our, our uh, observation of your loved one, we have noticed that she is particularly interested and experiences a lot of pleasure when she is in this type of activity and not so much in another activity, especially if, if the family member is advocating uh, for a, uh, their own preference uh, and not the, the resident. So that's another um, thing to, to keep in, in mind is that reporting back to family members about your observations of the resident's uh, emotional well-being uh, when they are in uh, one activity or another that is the, the activity that uh, you're, you're really not sure whether the family member is reporting their own preference or the resident's preference. It's another strategy to think about. All right. Thank you, Kimberly. Another question, and it's what happens if a family or friend refuses to complete the um, the Pelly interview? They say they just don't have any time. Yeah, this is this is tricky. Um, again, you may not be able to get this information from a proxy, um, but what we would recommend doing again is trying to reiterate the importance of how the information that this proxy could give you is something that can help improve the quality of care and potentially the quality of life of their loved one. 
Um, and again, if you're mm -hmm. able to um, sort of par down the Pelly into these, you know, a handful of items that is important to your organization, um, then you can say these are the, the top 10 most important, you know, preferences that we'd like your feedback on. And could you spare 10 minutes um, just to talk with me about that? And so maybe trying to do a little education and then ask only what, um, you know, ask a little bit at a time. And as you're developing a relationship, if they're able to see some improvement or they're able to see how you're putting these preferences into action, then they might be more likely to give you a little bit more of their time and tell you some more things. Kimberly, anything you'd like to add? No, I think that's a great summary, Katie. All right, we just had a question come in. Is there a place where we can watch the first webinar and I will go ahead and put that link in the chat box for everyone to view in a couple of seconds. While I'm doing that, I'll have um, Katie or Kimberly answer this other question, and is, and which is, how much time does the family member need to complete the task before the um, care planning session? How much? Um, yeah, I, I, this was, was sort of similar to, to what we thought about, uh, what we spoke to early um, in terms of um, the earlier question we had is, so if you have someone coming in and um, you need some proxy information, you might not recognize that you're unable to get information from the resident for a week or two, right? It may take a little bit for the person to get um, established and for you to develop a relationship and if you're trying to talk to the resident on three different days and times it may be it may be a couple of weeks and so um, again what we would recommend is trying to engage the proxy right from the start to say um, we may be reaching out to you to get some information about your loved one's preferences um, what would be best? Can we reach you by phone, by email? Would you prefer to come in and talk with us? Maybe setting the stage early on so that as soon as you're able to assess that you're just not able to get information from the resident, then reaching out to that proxy is not going to be a surprise. And then again, trying to say, um, here are the most important things that we'd just like to know right now and we'd love to have a longer conversation with you down the road. It just depends on um, your organization and the policies of your organization, how you're able to integrate this proxy information into the care planning um, document. Kimberly, anything to add? Yeah, I think, uh, again, the emphasis on, you know, doing uh, what your organization's um, policies are uh, require, but uh, the only point I would add is that, you know, unlike the MDS assessment, where there is a time um, limit uh, in terms of how uh, quickly uh, you can ask the information um, uh, that goes into the care plan. Uh, that is not true for uh, for the Pelly and anything related to the Pelly. So um, thinking ahead, you know, getting leaving lots of lag time and reaching out to uh, to family members to uh, give them an opportunity to respond. Um, is a is a good choice, and you don't have to uh, worry about any other kind of externally imposed um, uh, deadlines for that. All right, Th thanks, Kimberly. Um, someone just asked, is there a way to get a link to the printed slides? I know we are recording this webinar, and we are going to post it um, online within the next. I don't know, 10 days or so, but um, Dr. Abbott, do you think we are able to share a link to the actual PowerPoint slides? We should be able to do that. Um, we can probably put it up on the preferences, uh, preference based living website. So um, please sign up for the newsletter and we can put all that information in our November newsletter that will go out as soon as we have this webinar closed captioned. Um, and again, that, that link. Um, I'll, I'll copy and paste it here so that um, um, oh, I just did. oh, perfect, thank you, um, so that you're able to get that. And because the newsletter, we can certainly um, get you that information. And if that doesn't work, email us and we can send it to you privately. OK, 
Okay, and we just had a question that came up and it says, are they still being tracked? And the person who asked that question, if you can um, maybe clarify, I'm not too sure I know what, um, what you mean by um, still being tracked, but if you want to send me a message um, and clarify that, maybe we can answer that question. Um, so we will wait for that. And then another question is, um, who at the facility enters the nursing home um, or the um, data from the PELI when it's gathered from the family members? How is that entered and how is that used with nursing homes? Mm, that's a great question. So really this is up to every individual um, provider to, to figure out the processes by which they're going to be collecting this information. Um, and so and how they're going to use the data once they collect it. Um, some are using Excel spreadsheets to track their data. Um, some are doing it uh, via paper and pencil. And so it's really about um, who's the team of, in, you know, what's the team of individuals that are helping with this initiative? Um, and how can some of this workload be um, sort of um, spread out among the team members so that maybe there's one team member who is sort of the lead person on getting proxy responses. And so maybe there's somebody who'll say, hey, here's Mrs. Smith, I'm unable to get, I'm unable to interview her, would you please follow up with, the, with their, with their um, proxy? And then that individual could be the point person. So it's really thinking about what works for your organization we stayed away from issuing best practices because we think that every that we can we can offer suggestions of things that have worked in other organizations, but it really has to be tailored to your organization for it to be a best practice. All right, thanks, Katie. Um, so I think those are all the questions. If there are questions you would like us to answer, please email us. Our emails are um, on the screen right now and we will get back to you. So if you think about anything after the webinar, please shoot us an email and we will respond as soon as possible. Finally, I have some instructions for those who are seeking CEU credits. We need you to sign out of the webinar and complete the webinar evaluation. Please click the link um, in the chat box, which we will put up for you I just, to... I just posted. Oh, great. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. And um, so click on that link, complete, um, say when you signed out of the webinar, complete the evaluation, and we will um, send you um, your CEU PDF within the next couple of weeks. And then um, if you're not seeking CEU credits, we still would appreciate it if you would um, complete the webinar evaluation. So you can click on that link, or once you exit out of the webinar, um, you should be prompted to complete a quick Qualtrics survey um, with the webinar evaluation. So thank you so much for joining us today. And um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter where we will have a recording of this and you can get all of the updates about the, the Ohio Pelican Project. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.